Center for American Studies and faculty curator here at the Ransom Center. And it's um, my honor to welcome you to our final session of today. Can you hear me? Oh, is my mic on now? Can you hear me now? Hello? Ah, yes. Well, it's my honor to welcome you to the final session of our symposium today. My name is Steve Holscher. I'm a professor of American Studies and faculty curator here at the Ransom Center. Our session, Ethics of Culturally Sensitive Materials. And it seems like, to me, a perfect way to end an um, incredibly stimulating day. I want to begin by just um, connecting back to the second session. You'll recall that the final slide that Teresa Soto um, showed us uh, was a statement from the American Alliance Museum's Trends Watch 2019. And this is a photograph that I took of her last slide. And let me just read it briefly. Museums, in their cultural roles of memory keeper, conscience, and healer, have an obligation to, provo to provoke reflection, rethinking, and rebalancing. Museums can help us deal with the dark side of history, not just emotionally and personally, but in a way that helps us build a just and equitable society despite our legacy of theft and violence. And that strikes me as a um, suitable way to begin our discussion. I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Um, we're joined by three distinguished members of the community who will have um, uh, presentations and then we'll have a conversation after those presentations. Um, and I'm going to introduce the three of them together um, before we move on to the presentations. Our first presenter will be Jane Klinger, who earned her Master of Fine Arts in Conservation in Florence, Italy, at the Rosary College Graduate School of Fine Arts. Ms. Klinger is Chief Conservator of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and is responsible for the conservation and preservation management of the museum collections and the holdings. She has published articles and presented papers to various professional groups and universities in the United States and abroad, most recently as the keynote speaker at the Conservators Conference on the Conservation of World War II Materials in Warsaw, Poland. She's a fellow of the American Institute for Conservation, served on its board for a number of years, and is past president of the Washington Conservation Guild. Ms. Klinger is currently pursuing a doctorate in the Preservation Studies program at the University of Delaware. The focus of her research is on the identification and preservation material culture of trauma. Following Ms. Klinger is Naomi Nelson, Associate University Librarian and Director of the David Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library, Duke University. Over the course of her career at Duke and Emory University, she's worked with a number of collections documenting hate and oppression, including Nazi and Holocaust records, clan materials, publications by right-wing extremists, and the evidence of genocide and political repression. She's collaborated with colleagues to consider when to acquire such materials, helped create plans to process or catalog them, has taught with them, and has co-curated exhibitions and digital collections that make selected materials publicly accessible. Naomi has received an MLS from the University of Pittsburgh and a doctorate in American history from Emory University. She's presidential appointee to the National Historical Publications and Records Commission and a faculty member at the Rare Book School at the University of Virginia. Next will be Dr. Noel Trent, Director of Interpretation, Collections, and Education at the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, where she oversees its permanent and traveling exhibitions, collections, donations, and acquisitions, and education programming and initiatives. In her role, she's presented internationally at European Solidarity Center in Gdańsk, Poland, and at high schools also in Poland and Warsaw. She's recently curated an exhibition and planned the commemorative service, the museum's commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination, MLK 50. Dr. Trent is an accomplished public historian and has worked with several noted organizations and projects, including the National Park Service, the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site, 
and the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum for African American History and Culture, where she contributed to the exhibition Defending Freedom, Defining Freedom, the Era of Segregation, 1876 to 1968. She's a member of the American Association of State and Local History and the Association of African American Museums. Dr. Trent is Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Harvard University, Howard. where she, I'm sorry, Howard, excuse Howard me, University. excuse me. We were talking about Harvard a little bit earlier <laughs> and giving it a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> so, she's Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Howard University, where she also earned her doctorate in American history. Please join me in welcoming our three speakers today. Okay, I, it, is this, this, any, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, I just want to add my thanks to uh, whatever amazing person uh, thought of suggesting that I come and speak to you. And my thanks to all of the other organizers and my fellow speakers. My brain has been going off in a million different directions. And actually, I find I could have a lot to say about acquisitions, perpetrator materials, use of surrogates, both digital and analog, uh, continuing to evaluate our approaches using critical thinking, remaining curious about our visitors and about the other, in quotes. But I don't have time. So I will start uh, with the paper I prepared. In um, 1976, the United States Holocaust Commission was established by presidential charter. Its charge was to explore the commemoration of the Holocaust in the United States and what form it should take. Three years later, when Elie Wiesel, president of the commission, presented the final report, he emphasized memory as the fulcrum around which all of the activities of the commission revolved. The report also points to memory as the founding principle of the proposed hybrid institution, one that would serve as a memorial, a museum, and a research center. And in this photo at the top, we see Elie Wiesel receiving a very large gold key from Vice President Bush. Uh, the key was to two government surplus buildings, one of which would be demolished and um, the other would remain and become offices for the museum. And, and to replace the demolished building, they would build the museum, which you see in the bottom picture just four months before its formal opening. Well, last week, I was at a kickoff meeting for a new round of strategic planning where um, our director, Sarah Bloomfield, reaffirmed the museum's 2004 vision statement. And she also described memory, relevance, and permanence as the guiding principles of the museum. Now, for the survivors and their families, the artifacts in our collections are memory in tangible form. Unfortunately for many, there was no goodbye to friends and loved ones. There was no funeral. There is no gravesite. So the items they donate are the memorial to the people they lost, as well as proof of their unfathomable experiences. The idea of collections materials serving both as a memorial and as concrete evidence pops up time and time again in oral histories and testimonies. 
it not only speaks directly to the mission of the museum to preserve the memory of the Holocaust, but it's also reflected in our conservation policy, um, part of which I've quoted here. Now we're looking in the photo at Yehil Dinur Katsetnik, a survivor of Auschwitz, as he was testifying during the Adolf Eichmann trial in Jerusalem in 1961. The officer of the court holds up one of the camp uniforms submitted as evidence. Yahil was born Yahil Feiner, but upon immigrating to Palestine after the war, he changed his middle and last name, his middle name to Dinur, which means of the fire in Aramaic, and Katsetnik, or concentration camper in Yiddish. So when a camp uniform comes into the conservation lab for us to assess and possibly treat, we understand the import of the history and the evidentiary value it carries with it. These textiles, like other types of artifacts, bear the scars of their owner's experiences, the physical damage, stains, and accretions that come to serve as the testimony of difficult histories. Our first line of inquiry is to review what the donor says about the uniform and the history of the person who wore it, including the type of labor the person may have been forced to do. It's the imprint of that labor, whether it was mining coal, cutting wood, playing in a camp orchestra, or sitting all day in a tailor's workshop, where we can read the damage and deterioration of the textile itself. Why it's stretched across the back, why it may be stretched at the elbows or the knees, why tears appear where they did, and the source of stains. Well, some of the survivors continued to use their uniforms post-period, such as Alexander Kulishevitz in the upper left, he was a law student, uh, wrote a few papers that were distributed that were highly critical of the Nazi government, and so of course he was rounded up and sent to camp. He was also an amateur singer and songwriter. He composed dozens of songs during his nearly six years in Sachsenhausen, which he viewed as testimony of life in the camp. Here he's seen performing one of his works at the Teatro Comunale in Bologna in 1965. Other survivors wore their uniforms to memorial services and dedications, as we see in this photo of a ceremony for the victims in Neustadt in 1946. And of course, they were worn during reunions, such as the three survivors from Buchenwald in the studio portrait and a more casual portrait of survivors from Landsberg. And both of those photos were taken in late 1945. The more we know about the history of the uniform itself, the better we are able to assess original damage and original wear and tear from post-period use and even post-period neglect. This uniform was issued to Herschel Schreibman, who beginning in 1942, worked as a slave laborer at the Buna concentration camp, which was a subcamp of Auschwitz. Two years later, he was transferred to Flossenburg in Southeast Germany. There, he most likely worked in the production of fighter planes or other armaments. And you can see if you look at the hat, um, there's a repair, and I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but there's a repair in the back of the band um, to uh, keep the hat tight on his head. Uh, on the pants, I think you can notice at the right leg, there's a very large patch which was made from um, part of another uniform that had become unwearable. 
there, the rectangular stain just above that large patch uh, was characteristic of those left by synthetic adhesives. So a badge that may have been there, uh, we're not 100% sure, but probably, um, was adhered rather than sewn. At some point, the adhesive failed, the badge fell off, and was lost. Not visible in the photo of the pants are the two darts sewn at the back of the waist to uh, make it of a smaller size as Herschel was losing weight on the starvation diet. And I'll show you a closer view of the jacket. Um, and in the jacket, I think if you notice on your right side, it would be the, the left panel of the jacket, uh, there's some stitching across. That is because there's a hidden pocket on the inside. Hidden pockets were pretty common. If someone was lucky enough to find the material to make one, they were used to hide forbidden items such as an extra bit of food, writing implements, paper, um, or any other forbidden item. One detail on this jacket that really jumps out is the bright red thread that's sewn around the badge. We don't know exactly when this happened, but we're pretty sure it was after liberation because it would have been very difficult to get such brightly colored thread in the labor camp. Um, and I, I just want to point out the P indicates that Herschel was Polish. His number is stenciled on the badge, um, which um, is the same number, obviously, as, as what was tattooed on his arm. And the red inverted triangle typically denotes a political prisoner, although we, we do know that Herschel was Jewish. Now, considering his long internment and hard labor, the uniform came to us Although very, very soiled, it was really in relatively good condition. In fact, we know Buna was one of the more brutal slave labor camps. The typical lifespan of the prisoners was counted in months, not in years. Um, and this was for several reasons. Uh, Buna, the, the Buna factory produced synthetic rubber. There was, were no... There was no OSHA, there were no health and safety regulations, so uh, the prisoners, other than literally being worked to death, were also exposed to um, some pretty strong chemicals and solvents. Now, since Herschel survived Buna for two years, uh, we actually surmise that he was not involved in synthetic rubber production, but was doing other labor at the camp. And in fact, the testimony of his son indicates that the uniform we have was issued to Herschel upon his arrival in Flossenburg, roughly a year before he was liberated by American troops in 1945. So the conservation protocol was to gently wash the uniform to remove the surface dirt and grime, but not any of the stains that evidenced its use. With each bath, the water was checked in order to avoid overcleaning. The goal of the textile conservator was not for the water to necessarily run clear, but instead checked for signs that the particulates were removed, and I hope you can see that in the detail of the bath water. In this way, all of the accretions that are damaging to the fabric were removed while its history and the history of Herschel Schreibman was preserved and the stains remain. So at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, when we speak of ethics in conservation, we cannot help 
but speak of memory and the role it plays in our work. The provenance of most of the collections cannot be found in auction records or exhibition catalogs, but relies on rigorous historical research and the memories of survivors and witnesses. In order to develop an appropriate and sensitive approach to the conservation of Holocaust materials, the full context of what history can tell us about the object and what the object can tell us about its own history must be examined in detail. Now much of this work is done beyond the laboratory walls and brings the conservator into dialogue with the curator, historian, and donor. So in constructing an artifact's full provenance, historic and intrinsic values are intrinsically intertwined with the importance of memory. And it is this process that both informs and leads us to a principled and ethical approach in our conservation work. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to echo the thanks of um, other speakers to the HRC um, for this conference, for putting together such thoughtful panels, and to da Danielle Ziegler and the, the panel um, uh, leaders for so thoughtfully and seamlessly putting together the panels. It really is a pleasure to be here, and it's been a very interesting um, day and a half. I'd like to highlight two large collections that uh, were acquired by the Duke University libraries about 70 years apart, and then talk a little bit, use them as examples to talk a little bit about some of the questions and considerations that we are bringing to some of the collections that we hold related to hate and oppression. So the first collection came in the wake of World War II. In the immediate aftermath of the war, the Allies, Allies were intent on denazifying Germany. Um, in May of 1946, the Allied Control Authority signed a bill ordering all German schools, libraries, bookstores, and publishing houses to remove from their possession all books, pamphlets, printed materials, and even magic lantern slides that might convey Nazi ideology. And there were also Germans who were in, interested in just, uh, destroying evidence of Nazi activities and ideology for very different reasons. Uh, many of the publications ended up being pulped to provide paper for new textbooks for the schools. At the time, the Library of Congress was a leading U.S. purchaser of materials overseas, and they had identified documenting Nazi Germany as a priority. In October of 1944, the Association of Research Libraries asked Library of Congress if they would be willing to formally join together in a collaboration to collect these kinds of materials and distribute them to ARL libraries. This turned into one of the earliest cooperative library projects, so it's a little ironic that Nazi Germany sponsored that or um, inspired that. In some cases, the LC staff would follow the army into newly liberated areas to find materials. By the end of the summer of 1948, LC and the ARL libraries had amassed some 820,000 books and, period and bound periodicals. 72% of them went to ARL libraries. Duke was one of those libraries and received about 12,000 titles. And there was some discussion among the faculty about whether these, these materials were worth keeping and cataloging, um, as they, had, um, in, they were seen to have reprehensible um, content and that wouldn't have future use by some of the faculty. Other faculty and the library staff argued that the materials should be kept and cataloged, and over the course of some years they were. Uh, some of them went to the general library collection, some of them went to special collections. And over the years, students and faculty have found them in the stacks using the catalog or through browsing and been surprised that a Southeastern University would hold such strong collections um, in this area. And they have become an important resource for teaching and research on campus. The other collection was acquired directly from the institution that created it. Uh, in 2013, the Rubenstein Library um, brought in a collection of radical right-wing literature assembled over 40 years by the Southern Poverty Law Center's Intelligence Project. That project began in 1991 as Klan Watch and then expanded its mission in 1998 to bring in uh, materials from hate groups and extremists throughout the United States. 
The explicit purpose of the project was to shine a light on the activities and the ideology of these groups for the press, for law enforcement, and for the public. As a part of that project, they collected flyers, brochures, letters, books, all kinds of materials that were printed and distributed um, by the groups that the SPLC was monitoring. In all, there were 90 boxes that came to the Rubenstein Library. Uh, we agreed to redact mailing labels, addresses, and any other identifying material that might identify the groups or individuals who had helped to collect that material. Uh, in some cases, they were actually subscribing individually to these publications. Students have been dumbstruck when encountering these materials in classes. It's a very different thing to read firsthand um, from a, a um, printed periodical um, or from a, a book or flyer than it is to read about these groups in the newspaper or in scholarly accounts. So I'd like to share some of the considerations that are part of our ongoing internal discussions about whether to acquire such materials and when we do, how to ethically manage and provide access to them. A critical uh, it is critical to place the materials in context, and as with most materials, provenance is really important to understanding the records. So for example, the SPLC's collection of right-wing literature is intended to document the groups that the SPLC was actively opposing. So when we teach the, the SPLC collection, we discuss it as an authentic record of the SPLC's work rather than an accurate record of hate and extremism in the United States. In other cases, we might have the records of a particular leader of an extremist organization or the records of a nonprofit pursuing justice through the legal system or even a group of materials that, that was artificially assembled by a dealer. We try to be as transparent as we can about who is defining hate or extremism in the context of that collection. It's important to be very clear about where the metadata and descriptive text come from. Um, it's some of the organizations have very detailed metadata about the work that they're doing or the groups that they're documenting. We don't have the same expertise that they do, and we also don't have the time to go back through and double check all of that metadata. And so we might include it in the finding aid, but note that it came from the organization. The deed of gift with the SPLC specifies that the materials will be known as, quote, radical right-wing literature, close quote. And it was important to us to, ha to use words, the words that they were using to describe the materials. And so that is our source for saying that is why we are describing these materials this way in the finding aid. We often collect additional materials to provide a wider context. So for example, um, we wanted to make sure that we had documentation of anti-Semitism from other parts of Europe uh, to go along with the material that we had for, uh, documenting Nazi activities. And we present these kinds of collections along with the records of those who have resisted and opposed hate and, and repression. Um, and indeed, the activist organizations themselves are often the best source of information on some of those groups. These records were designed to invoke and spread hate and fear, and so they must be handled with care. Libraries make it easy to find and reuse information. It's something we do really well. And so it is important to think about um, both trying to make our materials accessible, findable, um, and equitably so, and not amplifying a message that might be harmful. We consider carefully before putting materials online. These materials may invoke a strong reaction in those who see them, whether the staff who are facilitating use, a student in a class, a researcher at the next table, or someone who's visiting an exhibition. Staff may need support and accommodations if they're working long-term and in-depth with these materials. So for example, the staff cataloging the SPLC materials, who were some serials catalogers from our general library collection, talked about feeling very strongly impacted by the materials. It was uh, very upsetting material. And they had developed some strategies um, to try to help themselves cope with that. Some human rights groups who do similar kinds of work um, of cataloging evidence of atrocities actually have counselors on staff. And we've talked with our staff about taking breaks um, away from the material, um, and we focus um, a lot of attention on how the work that we're doing together is really helping to document the, the genealogies of some of these groups in ways that would not be possible without that mass of material. On the other hand, there is a tendency for staff to become desensitized and to forget the impact the materials might have on others. And we've seen that, um, that uh, impact as well in staff working with the materials. One way to try to deal with disturbing or offensive content um, is to make a joke, to try to break the tension. 
and we have staff processing collections who have felt uncomfortable by others' attempts at humor as they pass by and might see something on a table or on a desk, um, making a joke um, out of perhaps the best of intentions. It's important that to talk about how we will talk among ourselves about these materials um, and about these collections and subjects. Uh, we have been talking in the Rubenstein Library about self-care in a number of different kinds of contexts um, as some of our work together and um, we're looking at how we're working with these materials in particular is an important part of that. We have a new code of ethics for instruction um, that we're using to, to try to get students to open up as they're working with materials and to try to prepare them from some of the, for some of the kinds of questions that we'd like them to ask as they're working with materials in the classroom. And we've been projecting that up on the screen, asking them to read it and reflect on it, um, doing a little discussion of it, and then referring back to it during the session. And there are two parts of that that relate specifically to collections that might be um, uh, related to materials that might be upsetting. Um, so the first one um, lets them know that there might be materials that might, are upsetting to them um, in the room and to be self-aware and to be kind to themselves and step away if they need to um, or use something else for a while if they need to. Um, and that is really meant to encourage them to be a little self-aware um, as they're in the space working with the materials and to give them permission to step away. Secondly, we talk about um, the language that might be used in historical documents, um, that some of that, that language might be racist or outdated. And we also talk about the fact that the language in some of our archival descriptive materials might also be racist and outdated. We, like many institutions, have not gotten back through all of our descriptive materials yet. And so we, we say, we, uh, remind them that when we discuss these items in class, we will want to use terms that reflect the way these communities refer to themselves today and so establish a community norm for the session. Finally, um, we think through, as we're thinking about these collections, about whether there are third parties who should be considered. So I mentioned that we redacted the names of the organizations and individuals that might have helped collect the SPLC materials. With other human rights collections documenting um, alleged perpetrators or victims of human rights abuses, we try to talk with the donors about um, how the sensitivities that there might be around those names, realizing that there could be real world um, consequences for folks whose names might be associated online uh, with particular events or particular subjects. And so I think Teresa um, helpfully reminded us um, in her talk this morning about the AHPN about the importance of really working with our donor partners um, on being sensitive about um, names and, um, and uh, pri issues of privacy. Uh, we also can impose restrictions um, or have researchers sign a privacy agreement before using a collection. But we try to be uh, very transparent with our donors that um, we can't promise them that if we put a restriction on the collection that we can truly keep it um, restricted if the federal government comes or if we get a subpoena or something else. Um, there are limits on what we can do in terms of restricting materials. Uh, and so that's an important collection to have as well. So I look forward to a broader conversation. Um, thank you. And uh, I will hand things over to Noel. All right, can you hear me? Great. Um, so I am, like my colleagues here on the panel uh, this afternoon, honored to be here um, and excited to have this conversation among uh, like-minded individuals. It's always great when you can really and truly nerd out with people who understand your language. It's so rare, right? Um, so today, uh, what I would like to do is just talk about ethically, ethics of culturally sensitive materials and how we at the National Civil Rights Museum uh, handle this, particularly uh, when we're dealing with it in the interpretive environment. And as I was preparing for this, I reflected back on the question that was sent, sent to us. And the initial question to spark our inspiration was how should institutions and communities responsibly collect, curate, conserve, interpret, and provide access to records of oppression, hate, and violence? 
The glib answer is very carefully. Um, however, I want to more astutely unpack this and how it's done, uh, and particularly our challenges at uh, the National Civil Rights Museum um, and what we experienced as we prepared for MLK 50, which was last year, the 50th anniversary commemoration of Dr. King's untimely death. We just commemorated um, the 51st anniversary uh, yesterday. So the National Civil Rights Museum is located in Memphis, Tennessee, and it occupies the historic Lorraine Motel in downtown Memphis. It was purchased in 1945 by Walter and Lori Bailey, an African-American couple, uh, and it was one of the few places where African-American travelers could stay when traveling through the segregated South and particularly segregated Memphis. So to give you an idea, people like Sam Cooke, Aretha Franklin, all stayed at the Lorraine Motel. Songs like Wait to the Midnight Hour or knock on wood or uh, written at the Lorraine Motel. And here in our courtyard, at one point, there was a pool, so it wasn't unusual to see Isaac Hayes and other artists from the Stax record label, which wasn't too far away, hang out here at the Lorraine Motel. So it has this storied history before the tragic moment of April 4th, 1968 at 6.01 p.m. when Dr. King was tragically gunned down on the balcony of room 306, which you can see where we have the reef designated there. This moment forever changed the motel, its location, and its significance in history. In 1991, after several years of a community effort and a collaboration with the state of Tennessee, the museum uh, opened, and it was the first museum in the United States specifically dedicated to telling the story of Af the African-American civil rights struggle. Uh, in 2002, we purchased the Young and Morrow building, uh, which, is late, which was later known as the Legacy Building or the Boarding House, and this is where the fatal shot was taken. In 2014, we completed a $27.5 million renovation, which allowed us to re-examine our interpretation as well as add new technology in that, into the museum spaces. You look here, you'll see some of that. Um, some of our new exhibition spaces um, that were part of that. And behind me here is the legacy building, or the boarding house as we now call it. Uh, this is the bathroom in the boarding house where the alleged shot was fired from. Now, as part of the renovation process after the museum reopened, one of the things that we did as an institution was to step up and re-examine our mission statement. And so the mission statement uh, today reads, um, has central themes. One, to chronicle the key episodes of the American civil rights movement, examine today's global civil and human rights issues, and provoke thoughtful debate, and serve as a catalyst for positive change. Uh, you note that's pretty simple to do. Um, not complicated at all. Um, and one of the things that we've, we've wrestled with and realized uh, is that we are an institution dedicated to telling a story of the past and the present. And that allows us to occupy a space that's very unique uh, for many museums and other institutions. And for us, we know that we cannot tell the story and the successes of the oppressed without explaining for folks what the oppression looked like. And it means that when people come through the museum, when they visit, that this is an emotional experience. And we, have to, we are aware of that sensitivity. When I first started at the museum about three and a half years ago, we brought in some consultants to help us reassess how we were doing our interpretation with our tour guides. And they used this paradigm. Green was uh, the comfort. Visitors are very comfortable. They're easy, they're breezy, they're having a good time. Yellow is they're slightly uncomfortable, but they're going to hang around, but something's just not right. And red is get me out of here. After going through our museum, uh, these consultants said to us, uh, by the way, most of your visitors 
are probably between, you'll see here, yellow, green, and red, orange. Now that's not a bad thing. It just means that the experience here at the museum, the moment you step out of the car in the parking lot, you are automatically keyed up. You know what you are going to experience. People anticipate when they see the marquee that they, they're going to see the place where Dr. King was killed. And that brings an anxiety that brings a nervousness, that brings an anger and a frustration and other emotions to the forefront. Anecdotally, uh, yesterday, uh, a, a writer, Panama Jackson for TheRoot.com and Very Smart Brothers, wrote about his experience on visiting the Ra Little Rain Motel in an article saying, visiting the Lorraine Motel in Memphis was the most emotional museum experience I ever had. And in it, he says, as I walked up on the museum and saw its physical presence and location, it almost felt surreal. For starters, it's so much smaller than it lives in my mind because of its significance. You almost forget that it was an actual motel. I got caught up in the history and the sadness and more or less paced back and forth up the length of the museum for about 10 minutes, working myself up to go inside. I couldn't stop staring at the balcony. There's a wreath that hangs on the railing where Dr. King was felt. His experience, his response, getting ready, getting himself geared up to go into our space is not unusual. So you can see here, a lot of people think that they're going to see the King Room, but there's so much more. We have 24 galleries and exhibitions. And it, we tell the stories of the movement from Rosa Parks to the sit-ins, and ultimately... Room 306, where Dr. King spent his last few hours. Now, last year, we were more directly confronted with the challenges of telling this story when planning our uh, MLK 50 exhibition. It was incredibly important to us that as an assassination site, to collect information related to that story. So we know that there is this historical significant and there significance and there are still these documents and photographs out there. But there are also still people who witnessed what happened, who remember where they were, who remember the experiences of the sanitation strike, whose parents participated in the strike, who remember being on curfew and were affected by that. And we acknowledge that we had to be sensitive to that. We also, as an institution, hold the evidence collection from the Shelby County District Attorney um, that they had for uh, James Earl Ray. Um, and we, but we wanted to round that out. We just didn't want to be about the evidence that was collected by Shelby County and the FBI. And so we went about looking at the stories that we wanted to see, what video footage was out there, what photographs were out there. What about the people who were there, people who came who saw, who experienced this moment. How were they affected? And we put together some really great stories. By the way, that exhibition is available for any of your institutions. See me afterwards. <laughs> Not kidding. Um, but one of the things that we found out through happenstance uh, was uh, photographer Art Shea. Shea um, was based in Chicago, and he was a freelance photographer who flew into Memphis on the evening of April 4th. Uh, when arriving in Memphis along with other media as the custom was of the day because, believe it or not, there was a time when folks didn't have cell phones. So he uh, was uh, flying next to a gentleman named Gary Wills who was writing for Esquire magazine. Uh, Gary says, hey, you checking out this King thing? He said, absolutely. He said, well, you want to share a rental car? Great. And back in those days, you could roll up to the police department, say you were with the press, and ask if you could follow them around and take pictures of what they were doing. They did. And from the evening of April 4th until Dr. King's body was put back on the plane to go home to Atlanta, Art Shea took photographs of what was happening in Memphis. And so that was part of, this is some of the exhibition. Um, but his photography was known to be gritty, urban, confrontational. And for the 1960s Polite Society, Life magazine, who had hired him, actually did not use a lot of his photographs. So when his archivist called us and said, we have these photographs, I can send you uh, some of them to take a look at, would you be interested? I said, absolutely. 
Turns out they were from 68 and they were in color. I've never seen photographs from any of the King events of the aftermath in color. And we had to look through them because he took pictures of everything. From the evening of April 4th, we see young men being arrested by cop and held by the cops, by cop cars, um, very strong allusions to what we see happening today, to R.S. Lewis and Sons Funeral Home. The question before us as an exhibition team was, which photographs do we show? We respect the story of Dr. King. We respect his family. The reality is that while we as a country and a world lost a leader of nonviolence and love, someone else lost a father. Someone else's father never saw them graduate from high school. Someone else's father never saw her speaking for the United Nations. That's Dr. Bernice King. Someone else never got, never got to meet her grandfather. That's young um, Yolanda King. So we had to weigh, what, what do we do? And we don't want to sensationalize. We don't want this to become the graphic thing that it gets circulated on social media and things like that. So we made some very tough choices about what we wanted to highlight. So we tried to give some reverence to what we displayed in the exhibition, as you can see here, in the remembrance area. But instead of showing repeated images of the coffin, we chose to emphasize the mourners, the people who came, because incidentally, most of the folks who came to R.S. Lewis and Sons and waited for hours to pay their respects for Dr. King, to Dr. King were also there at Mason Temple the evening of April 3rd. So we collect these items because we know that this story matters. We know that these photographs have value. And Art Shea sent me an artist statement before he passed away uh, saying that he wanted to take these photographs. He took photographs of these moments so people would not forget what happened. He wanted this to be preserved. So we're working with the estate now. We have a collection of just under 100 photographs in our holdings right now. But we also know that now may not be the right time to display all of that. But they have value and they have significance. When we look at the stories we tell at the National Civil Rights Museum and how we tell the stories and who we represent, we identify with the actors, we represent the oppressed, we represent the historically underrepresented communities. And we want all of them to be respected as human beings. That is a rare thing to have happened. It's a very new phenomenon within the last 30 or 40 years to ensure that they are represented as full human beings occupying the full spectrum of human emotions and capacities. And so we, we, we make sure that we do not allow people to gamify or role play into the experiences. We treat it with sensitivity, but it's a fine line. Um, it's a line that we continue uh, to walk um, and try to do as successfully as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have the opportunity to lead discussion for a few minutes before we open up for a more general conversation. And I'd like to... Um, I guess begin with um, you were talking about self care, and before our um, a panel began, we were also talking about self care. Each of you um, works in institutions and with materials um, that are very difficult and can be difficult for different people in different ways. And I know that these might be conversations that you have within the communities that you work with, but they're typically not, I think, public conversations. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about the sort of things that, that you all do and might recommend for other people working with difficult materials over the years. I can start. Um, so I think um, that as we think about working with one of these collections that are coming up with the plans for it, it's helpful to build some of this into the processing plan or into the 
um, maybe the event planning or other things. Um, and so making sure to build in enough time um, so that if someone needs to be working on that material for a while and off for a while, they can. We had someone who was doing detailed descriptive work um, of some, some radio transmissions about the political situation in Haiti, which um, could, could be very uh, distressing. Um, and so um, she would work on those for a while and then work on something else for a while, and that meant it was going to take longer to do the work. And so we made sure to build, build that in so that she wouldn't be stressed out about that. Um, having folks to talk with, knowing who you can go and talk with in your organization or within your department, um, who has some understanding of the context in which you're working, um, can be very helpful. Um, and having some pieces of the project that are affirming, whether it's working on um, materials or with a part of, the, uh, of a program that is getting at folks who are resisting um, and fighting back, or whether that's working on some scholarly work or an entirely other aspect of the collection and having some sort of public outlet like a blog post or something um, can be some helpful thing. So those are some of the things that we have talked about. There are so many directions I could go to answer this, and we ha actually had a, a brief conversation, but um, and I'm not sure if uh, what I'm going to start off with is something you can do, but I know it's you mentioned it, and that is um, for myself and my staff is to speak to the survivors. Um, they, in many ways, are our inspiration. And I have never met a group of people so full of life and hope and humor. Uh, and so that, I know, helps, uh, helps us. I've brought survivor donors into the lab to talk about their items and they're almost every single time we end up laughing about something and they talk about some sort of humorous thing um, there's one um, person uh, Louise who donated a small wicker chair that was her and her older brother's chair when they were in hiding. It was also their only toy. And so she told stories about the two of them fighting over the chair, throwing it at each other. And, you know, here we are, we're trying to preserve it and conserve it. <laughs> and yet we have this image of these two little kids just literally beating each other up with this chair. Um, so that's, that's, that's something I would say. But, um, and also to keep one's sense of humor. Um, even that I showed you a photo of Kulishevitz. If you read his songs in translation, there's a lot of humor in them. It may be a very dark humor, but there, the humor is there. Um, there's just something, uh, when I was studying theater, it's you know, the idea that we laugh so as not to cry, mm -hmm. and th I, that still seems to hold true. I think for, for us, one of the things that we've done is not to just look at it from the curatorial or collections, um, aspect of it or your management and your admin staff really looking at what's happening on the front lines. I think that um, as a field we tend to neglect what's happening on the front lines and our front line staff is really getting the brunt of the action and with the climate of the country changing and shifting what it means, I'm not going to get political in that way, but what it does mean is that your staff are getting encounters with comments, and while they may still deliver excellent customer service, people are more free to express judgment and pejoratives to your staff, uh, and they swallow it. People are afraid to tell what it's doing, particularly if you are predominantly, well, I'm just going to speak plain, um, 
I may not get invited back, but I'll speak plain. Um, particularly if you're a predominantly white institution and one or two people of color, right? The person of color may not feel like they can, can appropriately talk about what's happened to them. It's really hard to take that on day after day. And then when you add on top of that a social incident like Eric Garner or Michael Brown or something that happens locally, that person is experiencing trauma, right? And we don't acknowledge that. We don't acknowledge that that's trauma, that that, that is happening to them. And so, yes, building in work breaks is great, but how are you allowing these dialogues to facilitate? How are you, how are you creating, a, an adjusting the system and culture within your organizations to make sure that people feel empowered and that there's a language of inclusiveness? Inclusiveness and diversity is not just something that we write as an administrative policy, it is an action and it is an ongoing deliberate engagement. We had an incident several months ago where a visitor said something inappropriate to one of our staff members um, and used a pejorative. And they came to me because I kind of let it be known to them, um, you know, if you got any questions or you have a difficult situation, I can give you some interpretive language. Um, and they told me what happened. So we, uh, myself and some other the senior directors got together and said, okay, let's do a, a lunch and learn feedback session. Talk about what happened and let's talk about other instances and give them the language and procedures and protocols so they now feel empowered. In that session, we found out that there were more comments happening than we ever thought. Now this is the place where Dr. King died. I didn't think people would be this free with their language. And I'm not going to say what was said because of the confidentiality of the conversation. And I respect those relationships. But it troubled me that the country has changed. And if someone feels that comfortable at the place where Dr. King died, I can only imagine what's happening in other places. It means that if we're really serious and looking about being culturally sensitive and aware and developing a strong code of ethics in our cultural steward stewardship, we have to deal with the cultural stewards. And the cultural stewards are our human infrastructure. We gotta start caring about our people. Uh, if I could no, jump in, sort of, sort of related, <laughs> but not exactly the same by any means. Uh, we used to have comment, not cards, but notebooks. Um, because with the number of visitors we get to have cards, we would have been completely inundated. And the notebooks were, are, were filled by the end of the day. So often in reading through, and we would not, it wasn't my job, but there were people who would read through and look at the comments. And there were, so many of them were if the Jews had only accepted Jesus, if the Jews only hadn't committed sins, this only happened to them because of sins, what, what did it make us realize? We needed to do better to, in our exhibitions, to educate the visitor what this was all about. And yes, the Jews, my relatives, my family, were top of the list, but at the same time, the Roma and the Sinti were not even considered good enough for labor. They were killed immediately. There was no mention of the Roma and Sinti in those comments. Very little mention of Jehovah's Witnesses who were considered enemies of the state and were often rounded up because they believed in equality for all. What they called Michelin because of soldiers bringing, going to North Africa and bringing their, their wives and, and mixed race children back. Um, the disabled. Uh, so somehow we weren't doing well enough. Um, and so it caused us to really reevaluate and go into some critical thinking about how do we educate the people just walking in the door so that by the time they leave, they're really thinking about 
and I'm using a tagline that we had for a while, which was, think about what you saw. That's what they wa- we wanted them to do. So we took the opportunity to turn this around and, and do some real hard reflection. I'd like to stick with the, the visitor experience for a second. And your comments now make me sort of change how I was going to ask it. Initially, I was interested in what we might call trigger warnings. Mm -hmm. So this museum um, has difficult material. Please be prepared for it. Um, Faculty sometimes put such language on core syllabi. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, I was curious what your institutions do, whether it's an archive or a museum, to uh, prepare people for these difficult um, materials. But now I'm wondering if it's not a bit more complicated than that, that maybe it's not just trigger warnings, but materials that are necessary to help people understand the seriousness of it in, in ways that, um, again, I'm just I'm surprised and terribly disheartened to hear your story and, in, and yours also. So the things that your institutions do to help prepare visitors, the huge variety that you see come through your doors. Well, I think what's really important is that both of our institutions respect the autonomy of the visitor, right? So our, our visitor experience, we, we work very hard to be very clear in the interpretation, be empowering to it. Um, and, and what we speak about is really a small percentage of a largely very supportive audience that both of our institutions have. It's just a few bad apples, if you will. But, you know, we have to deal with those realities and the, those consequences that, that can reverberate from them. Um, you don't want to over-prescribe for the visitor what they're going to encounter. Um, but we do give some advice about what they're going to see. So when people say, how long is it going to take? Oh, it could take you two hours. It could take you four hours. It could take you eight hours. It just depends on how intentional you want to be about going through the experience and how you go through museums. Is this, will this museum make me cry? Well, it depends if you cry a lot. Like if you cry over a puppy on a computer screen, this may wreck you. I, I mean, you know, I <laughs> it, may, it may get to you. Um, but I don't know, uh, and I was talking to a colleague who worked at a museum internationally, and he was dealing with a civil rights story, and he said, we're very concerned about people crying in the galleries. And I said, well, why is crying in a gallery a bad thing? Why is it a problem if someone is so moved by something we're talking about that it brings up an emotion that they were unaware that they had? It means that there's something about our interpretation, something about the way that we presented the material that's causing them to think. The other thing that I tell our tour guides is to realize that the impact of someone's visit is not necessarily relevant in the moment that they walk out of the museum. So someone could tell you, you know, in that moment, oh, I love this, and then someone could walk out stone-faced. But in the days, weeks, months, or years to come, what they saw at the museum will stick with them and will change them. And we've had donors, um, people who sent money back, small amounts of money for years, um, just because of one visit to the museum. So I think we have to be very careful about how we try to structure someone's visit. We don't want to over-prescribe what they're going to experience. We want to respect their autonomy, but we have to realize we don't know what's going on with them when they come. But the fact that they showed up, there's some part of them that's curious. Do you have a response to that, Jane? Um, I agree with everything she said. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'm going to answer the next one. (laughs) How about you for your your archive? Um, How do you prepare? You did talk about this, and this is one of the things that I did know. You, you do um, talk to students, but could you give us a bit more detail about how you prepare them? Well, I, I, again, we're not trying to over-prepare them mm-hmm. for this. We're just trying to get them to be in a space where they are able to be self-reflective um, in the moment. Um, I think one of the things that, that we have thought about with exhibitions um, is um, giving people some choices about seeing things. So when they're coming into our library, they don't necessarily know that they're coming into an exhibition. 
Um, they may think they're just coming into a library. We have a gallery that's just in the entryway that you have to walk through to get into the building. And so we think about what's in that space versus a space where they can choose to go in and see something that might be a little bit more challenging. Um, so, and we also, we've got all different kinds of people coming in and out of the building and try to think about that as well. Um, okay. Thank you. Are there things that, it, I'll ask one more question and then we'll open it up for general conversation. Are there things that in each of your institutions you think should not be shown? Sometimes it's not up to us. There's, um, it's part of the deed of gift. And if a donor writes restrictions on it, we have to honor those. Um, there's a photo I love, and I wish we could show it because we have we have uh, in our collections a model of the Woods Ghetto, mm -hmm. and it's sort of in what I call a violin case, but it's not shaped like a violin case. It's actually shaped so that when you open it up, it takes on the shape of the ghetto. And there are all the major streets, the bridges between the two sections, because there was a main road for wood that ran through the middle that the Jews were not allowed to step foot on. So bridges were built, um, various buildings, uh, the little buildings are marked. And there's a photo, uh, and unfortunately I'm not, rem if I were a better curator slash historian, instead of a conservator, focusing on the condition of this model, um, I would remember the name of the man who put it together. Um, there's a photo of him with his first wife, and they're holding up the model and it's not finished yet. So you can see it as a work in progress and how he outlined it, what the, sort of the steps he took to, to build this model. Uh, she un unfortunately perished. He uh, married after, after the war, after immigrating to the US, um, also uh, to just insert uh, when the ghetto was being liquidated, um, he buried the model and told two people, other people, where it was. And the deal they made, whoever survived, would go back and retrieve it. Well, luckily he survived and then um, was, went to DP camp, came to the States, met his second wife, and he um, his daughter, his adult daughter, donated the model and some various papers of, of his, which included this photograph of the first wife. And so she stipulated, we are never, ever to show that photograph because she doesn't want to remind her mother that he was married before because she thought this would be hurtful to her mother. Now, as much as I don't quite understand that, my husband was married before, and I know that, and I've seen photos, and big whoop. But, uh, you know, I got him, and I got him now, and I've had him for much longer than his first wife did. Uh, but <laughs> but um, we still have to honor that, and it's in the legal papers. So in, in, in our case, it's often due to donor restrictions. Any other restriction may be due in our, our main exhibition. We have privacy panels, and we say not suitable for uh, children under the age of 11, and that was in consultation with um, child psychologists. Um, so there's, and I've seen parents lift their kids up 
to be able to see it. So it's parental choice. It's up to them. So in a sense, we don't exactly censor, but we do give an alert. Um, I think for us, um, our biggest issues is, I think what a lot of institutions have, you just don't have enough people to do the work, right? And so um, we have, we're growing our collection right now. And we're, getting, we're getting interesting things um, every day. Uh, but there are still some pieces. And, you know, the, um, you know, we think of how Dr. King lived, particularly his last year of his life. And um, still finding more and more fascinating documents. And I wish I could fast forward another 30 years when we could see, see, you know, there's a longer arc. We can see what happens when we find more materials and see what that story is. So I feel like we're kind of mid arc, even though it's been 50 years since that moment, because we're still collecting a lot of stories. We're still kind of pulling that together and trying to put together you know, what people were experiencing uh, from February 1st when the two sanitation workers were killed through April um, when the sanitation strike was settled. We're still trying to help fill in that story and, and understand all of those dynamics. And the um, Senate's commission actually put r restrictions on the records for both the Kennedy assassination and the King assassination. So those don't even come available until 2029. I will probably be second in line when my staff members would be first in line as soon as they come available. We're taking a look. But so there's a story that feels incomplete, right? Because there's just things we don't have. And I wish, you know, the one thing that's great about this field is that time allows us to see more and appreciate history in its fullest. We're just kind of stuck in a mid time frame, and I wish we could speed it up to see more of what this, what 68 was truly about. Um, but I enjoy the process of being part of people who get to help pull that story together. Yeah, I, th I think we, we are collecting materials to make them accessible, right? So we do have some materials that have some time-based restrictions on them that are usually um, about personal safety rather than about the content itself in terms of being um, extremist, for example. Um, we will make choices about how we make that content available. So um, there's a lot of our collection that we're probably not going to digitize and just put up on the web um, because um, that feels more like amplifying than, than like providing access to it. Um, so, Actually, I do have one more question. You, you led to it. Sorry. <laughs> um, the digital world. How has that impacted your work? It, 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 so it makes everything so much more findable, doesn't it? And yes. so the thing that is great about that is that people know that we hold these collections. Um, but it does mean that we need to be careful about how we describe them. Um, and so you know, I, I mentioned that um, some of our human rights collections, uh, someone's name is associated with something that could be dangerous to them. Um, and so we need to be careful in talking with our donors because it, it just, and we find this with all of our collections, right, that people are, are searching for themselves in the collections and it makes things a lot more findable and it also makes it a lot easier to comb through a lot of data and pull things together in new ways. Um, in some ways we want to be able to do that on the scholarly side um, and we worry about what that might look like um, on the public side sometimes. Yeah. You're looking at me? I'm looking at you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> interesting you should ask about digitization. Um, we are committed to making all of our archival collections, archival and manuscript collections, available uh, as long as there aren't restrictions. Um, there's a big push. As a conservator, I push back a little bit and say, wait a minute, we need to slow down because the, our digitization team is focused and our archivists are focused on the informational content. And from my point of view in dealing with the materiality, don't we want to put our best foot forward and so shouldn't these collections go through conservation first? Um, in some cases, we're in agreement because they're in a condition where um, there may be folds or creases or 
tightly rolled and the information can't be read. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm, I have never, ever, ever believed that digitization is a fully preservation methodology. It cuts down on handling by researchers, but again, it means it's findable. And we have many more loan requests now for the original documents. Um, we actually could use another loan registrar because of it. I could use more staff in conservation because of that. Um, so from where I sit, um, digitization leads to more use of the real stuff. You know, I, I look at digital digitization, digital assets as both a blessing and a curse. Like, it depends on how you use it. It's really just another tool, right? Um, it's, it's like when digital cameras came out or I was working in the National Archives when they were looking at putting documents. This is a while ago, so... Uh, as an intern, when they were putting documents on CD, and I remember that first conversation, that was an intense meeting. That was my first like staff meeting. I've never seen archivists go at it. <laughs> when they were talking about early digitization days and what we were doing and then all the files, and I was like, whoo, this is intense. Um, so I think it, it has value. Yes, it cuts down on some things, but, but we have to look at it. And, and what bothers me about some of the things that are happening with digitization is that not enough of us who are trained in how to use these things and trained in the scholarship are being consulted with this. It's just not happening. You know, you get these folks who, by all means, they're, they, they're well-intentioned, um, but they're tech folk. They're, they're business people. They develop these models. But no one's consulted with any of us, uh, at least no, no one's ever asked me. Um, and and they, they go into these, these uh, they go in, and they're not considering some of the things that we all have been trained to consider from a pedagogy, from a methodology. There are just certain things that we wouldn't do, right? And then all of a sudden they're saying, well, you could do this, this, and this. And you're thinking... Well, back in when I took this class on Archives 101, that was not a good idea, sir. You know, um, and so I have a problem with that. I think there needs to be more collaboration with that. Um, I know that we get very protective about our resources as we should, but I would like to see a little bit more consultation with us because... Um, we have a lot to bear in this. I think this can be really great, but I wish they would just consider us as resources rather than clients or commodities. That's a big problem for me. Um, the other big problem for me is this idea of, I think it's great in terms of what the digital world can do and help people understand an era and understand people and virtual reality and, and augmented reality and all the various realities in between. Um, but I think we have to be very careful with how we gamify historical experiences. Just because we can recreate a labor camp in Europe during World War II and you can walk the grounds does not mean that you now understand what it was like to be a Holocaust survivor. You do not. You can empathize. You have a better understanding of the context. But while we can use photographs and, and through uh, her work, we can put together, you know, the, the, the um, uh, a avatar with the appropriate costume. You have no idea and it is disrespectful to those individuals to do that. It's the same thing with slavery. It's the same thing with indigenous people. You do not get to occupy those historical actors' place in history by taking on a digital role. And I have a big problem with that. I think it's a great learning tool, but we got to be careful. And I think as a field, we got to step up and say, nah, no, that, that's a line we don't need to cross. Yeah. I'm sorry, that's my soapbox. Yeah. But I, I definitely agree with that. And, and sort of backing up a little bit from virtual reality, just a few years ago, there was that popular game, Pokemon Go, oh my God. where people would, you know, run around. Well, all of a sudden, we started seeing people in the museum running, and it, it took us uh, not very long, but because 
could just ask him, what the heck are you doing? And it turned out that the company had placed these virtual little Pokemon thingies, whatever they're called, um, in the museum, in the Holocaust Museum. So our legal department, of course, <laughs> mm-hmm. had to co- and say, you know, you got to stop. This is, not only is this inappropriate, that no, <laughs> yeah. just stop. And we saw your case. I think we read about it in the Washington Post. And so I had my interns. I said, okay, uh, interns, I need you all to play Pokemon Go in the galleries and tell me if there are any Pokemon in the king room. No, I'm serious because I was like, once we heard that that was happening, if this is happening at the Holocaust Museum, it could be happening at us. So we need to make sure that it's not happening there. I mean, that's the benefit of the social media and things, that we can be more aware in real time of what's happening. This is a reason why you have interns, because they know how to do this stuff yeah. so much better. <laughs> Just let them, let them go wild and say, is this inappropriate stuff happening in the digital world? I don't know, but here's my phone. Go, go figure it out. <laughs> or use your phone. Figure it out. Um, it, was, it, it was a great asset, and we were able to make sure that there, there weren't any. Um, but it is a big concern for us. Thank you very much. I would like to open it up for conversation from the audience. Yes. Hi, this question's for Naomi. Um, Did you come into a culture of wanting to teach with those materials, or did you have to build a culture around that? Because I know we have a lot of stuff where I work that we don't talk about, and don't use in classes, and it's just sort of there. So I'd be interested to hear your perspective on that. Sure. So I would say both of the institutions I worked with, there there was a culture that wanted to teach with the materials and was committed to um, putting them in context and to teaching them in a broader context. Um, And also... um, yeah, and to really digging into them. So uh, I think there's a, there was a, a sense of both um, feeling comfortable with having knowledge about the, the, the organizations, the materials, and other things, and also um, uh, with talking about charged subjects. Hi, this is a comment for Dr. Trent, and I would like to um, thank you for getting real there for a minute with us and um, bringing the conversation back to the human dimension of the work that we do. Um, As we all know, we don't leave our identities and our experiences and our traumas at the door when we come into work, and I just really appreciated um, what you said. And and, and also all of um, the panelists concern about self-care for the people that are doing the work. I mean, it's not something that you think about and it's, and I, though I don't deal with um, collections that are identified as having culturally insensitive material or trauma, you do find it in almost all collection and it's not more than once that I've pulled open a folder and gasped at what was inside and not expecting it at all. And I, I just thank you for focusing again on the people. Thank you. towards the back. Um, so this isn't really a fully formulated question yet, but I'm just c- curious about desensitization. Um, you know, knowing that there's a, a sort of fine line or a spectrum, I suppose, between uh, access, social media, um, awareness, and then at some level, desensitization to trauma. And I'm just wondering about whether or not you've experienced any changes over time, especially you know, being institutions that have been around for a while, in regards to um, younger generations and their ability to engage authentically with the experience of a place versus maybe experiencing something online um, in, in, in a way that's accumulated over time. Shockingly, we have not. Um, I I think that speaks to the power of place um, because this is where something happened. Um, I have seen children as young as six 
you know, who come into the museum like this, I'm like, does the child have eyes up here because they're just kind of really focused on their phone and they get to the king room and their parent, they've gone through the experience and they pause. Um, we have a recreation of the Edmund Pettus Bridge and we show some clips of Bloody Sunday. It's one thing if you've seen Selma um, and you could even pa play certain video games. It's another thing to see John Lewis and intellectually you know what's about to happen but it's completely different to be in a space that recreates something, feel the af asphalt, hear the noise around you, surrounding you, just taking in everything that's happened leading up to Blood Bloody Sunday and experiencing it. Um, it. It's part of the power of what we do. Um, I, I have seen some folks seemingly disinterested but come out very reflective um, I think this desensitization is something I'm more concerned about happening to staff because we compartmentalize in order to cope. Um, and how does that manifest in other areas of your life? I think it's more important. I mean, visitors is one thing, but people not losing context of what this place means. And sometimes we do it because we just normalize it, right? We normalize moving around in the space. We did a photo shoot as part of a, um, uh, an exhibit on um, I Am a Child, which was a protest thing that we did back in September. And I brought the photographer up when we're on 306 and we're staging the kids. And I just, I'm just talking to her about how she needs to get the best shot and where the light is and where she can stand. And I literally forgot she's standing in front of room 306, and this is the, this woman's first time on the balcony. And she just looks at me, and she's like, Noelle, I need a minute. And I was like, oh, my bad. Let me stop, because I've normalized this too much. I've got to give you your respect and give you your moment to encounter this. She had a few minutes, and then she was okay. But that's more of where my issue is with desensitization. Um, the power of the place is where we work at can bring, has brought people around. Yeah, I would say we hear from faculty over and over again that when they bring students in to work with um, the real thing, um, that, it, that it's an entirely different experience. And it, it really brings a history to life in, in an entirely different way. Um, then, and these are kids who have been using things online, who have, you know, um, who have been using ESTC or something else. So it's, we consistently find that that's the case. The power of the artifact and the power of the place that really speaks resonance with right us. There. Is there a question towards the front? Yeah. Yes. Just one more. Okay. I'll take one more question. Hi. Uh, like many um, of our peer institutions, Columbia has wrestled with uh, its own um, history and slavery um, and done so, I think, in a generally um, thoughtful way. Um, but it occurs to me that. Um, that this panel might be especially well equipped um, not to advise me, but to advise any of us whose um, institutions may in fact have also been the perpetrators of trauma. Um, and I wonder what lessons um, you've learned in your work that you might um, offer any of us. Thank you. I'll start <laughs> as the most likely perpetrator <laughs> institution up here. Um, well, I, I, I've got something to say. Okay. Do you want to start? <laughs> oh. No, I mean, my, my, my institution also, but p please go ahead. Okay. Um, so I will, I will say that our institution is a work in progress on that front. Um, I, I am uh, proud of our library's um, work to, um, to put in the work of trying to engage with um, the various um, traumas that have happened on campus over time and how they've impacted people. Um, I think we have found that uh, it is really important to um, be very open and upfront with students about what's happened and to let them explore the history and to give them ways of doing that. We had one student who talked about how important it was for her, for herself, to discover the Duke's history and to, find, and to really discover what that was from her own perspective. Um, we work closely with faculty to try to shape 
some of the ways in which we're doing those explorations, and there are a number of ongoing projects. Duke is very late in, in looking at um, the issue of slavery and its impact on our campus. Um, we are just starting to engage in that work now and are benefiting from others who have gone before us. Um, we are trying to regularly do programming around some of the difficult topics on campus for various different communities on our campus um, and to have something um, on sort of a regular basis of exploring that history, whether it's through an exhibition or through programming or through, we've done a number of um, programs called Duke History Revisited where students come in and choose a topic that they want to research for six weeks um, and they're paid for that and then they come up with some sort of deliverable, whether it's a blog post um, or a series of oral histories or some, one was a traditional research paper, one was a zine. So they've done a number of different things and then they present on that and then we have that information to go forward with. Um, and we're working with the larger campus on various issues of memorialization and um, with monuments as we talked about earlier and other kinds of things about how we tell our story. So I would say we're very much a work in progress but I, I'm very proud of, the, of my staff for the way in which they are engaging this work in a very authentic way, very open to the fact that we have tons of blind spots um, and could benefit from learning from others um, and really willing to engage with students um, and faculty and alums. We have a, a lot of alums who are very, very angry and rightfully so um, and it's been really important um, to us to, um, to do what we can to connect with them over time. I think my university, I, I can speak for it just for myself as a faculty member here, it's also a work in progress. Um, when I arrived here 20 years ago, uh, there were statues to Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and four other Confederate soldiers, um, and I never thought they would leave. It seemed so, they seemed so permanent. And it was, it was a good teaching moment in my Introduction to American Studies class to talk about, um, talk about memory and for us here, I think it's, it's um, in some ways more difficult even than the history of slavery. The history, the aftermath of Reconstruction and white supremacy is such a difficult moment in American history that is, we are really challenging it now. And I'm proud also of my university's um, effort to remove the statues, which took place in two, two, two summers. Um, and now the question is what to do now? And what to do now, what the, we were talking about this before, the empty plinths that remain. So for those of you who are visitors here, walk up the South Mall, and you'll see these plinths that are just remaining there with the names inscribed on them of what at one time was celebrated. Um, I was just looking at my phone right now because I want to give you all the correct URL to a brand new um, sort of vir virtual reality tour of the racial geography of this campus. This is not something I put together. My colleague in African American Studies, uh, Ted Gordon, did. Ted Gordon has been leading tours on campus for something like 15 years. And now, this is still in beta, but it's almost ready to go, but it's, it's ready to go enough that you can look at it online. It's simply racialgeographytour.org. And you'll hear Ted Gordon um, talk about the history of this campus as a, as a place that emerged in, as part of white supremacy, um, as part of its founding, as part of its funding. And there are elements of this talk about power place in the landscape itself. Um, so do take a look at that. It's a really, it's a powerful um, way to engage with um, an incredibly difficult past. And, like you, I'm proud of the work that my university has done, uh, but it's still very much a work in progress. I, I would also say um, I think it's great the work that both institutions have done, but when we're looking at the legacy of slavery with these universities and these institutions, um, you know, what some of the departments and some of the areas you guys represent is one place in a larger institution. So it's a larger systemic issue, right? So I'm not saying go down and take down the system because y'all want to keep your jobs, right? Um, but the thing to really think about is that this is also an issue of equity, right? And so in looking at how to address it, the education programs are great. Um, building greater campus awareness, bringing a culture of inclusion and diversity, but there's also some issues of equity in our own field, that there are not people of color, there are not people who are descendants of these enslaved 
people engaging in the preservation of these stories. And similar to efforts that have been made to make sure that the indigenous communities have the opportunity to, to be formally trained in the methodology behind the preservation, that may be an entryway into that because some of these students have not gone into this field because they're just not exposed to the opportunities. I think this is a great field. I think it's awesome. Frankly, I'm a little jealous of our collections manager because sometimes she gets to hang out with documents for hours at a time and I've got to go deal with policy. Um, but it's great. And there are students, I think, who would want to learn about this. Think about what opportunities there are to expose students who maybe would not have even considered the work that we do as a viable option for a career. It's worth us re-examining what we're educating and who we're talking to um, about those options. Um, and it's part of a larger systemic conversation. And as the universities have these conversations of addressing equity, um, I know Georgetown did a lot of some financial things. I don't know how, I, don't, I hope the Rare Brooks collection got a little money to do some, you know, extra preservation work. If not, they should. Um, but maybe as those conversations are happening from a financial perspective, you could slide in, okay, if you're going to be giving out extra funds to deal with this issue and create equity, those of us over here in the collections area, we would like some extra money, and this is what we can do with it, and this is how we can better address this. This is how we can help you so that they don't come to you once the incident has happened. You're already part of the conversation and they're already invested in what you're doing. Excellent. Well, this gives me the opportunity to thank our three panelists and thank Steve Ennis and Daniel Sigler for putting this all together today. <laughs>